Hello, welcome to MK Crypto Diaries, episode two. I am your host, Dr. Justine Sherry Herrera, and today is the 11th of November, 2022. Today, we'll be speaking about decentralization versus centralization. Are decentralized protocols really decentralized? What are the different dimensions of a protocol? Is Ethereum post-merge centralized or decentralized? Does Mika, the new crypto asset service provider regulation, cover DeFi? And more. Today, we have here with us Enrico Rossi. Enrico is an academic researcher. His academic background includes two masters and a PhD from the London School of Economics in various topics, including business, economics, and law. He also obtained Best Dissertation of the Year for one of his masters. He is currently a full-time researcher at UCL, focusing on hot topics such as crypto assets, DLT, property rights, but also law, economics, and regulation. He is also a lead researcher for distributed financial markets infrastructures at Cambridge Alternative Finance Center. I'm also very glad um, to announce that Enrico has recently accepted a position which will be starting soon in the crypto policy and regulation with the FCA. So big congratulations, Enrico, for that um, massive role. Uh, You'll definitely make a... a a big, a big influence um, on the, the future of regulation in the UK. Uh, so really exciting. Um, and also, thank you very much for joining us today for this uh, interesting dis- discussion. Um, so, so let's just dive right in because we have a lot to discuss and, and a lot of questions and that I would like to cover. Um, so just to start um, with a bit of an introductory question, uh, can you, for the benefit of our listener, Um, Just give a definition of decentralization and how it differs from centralization. Thank you, Justin. Uh, It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, yeah, I'm I'm, I'm very glad that we can speak about these topics. Um, So it's uh, it's a very difficult uh, topic, the topic of decentralization. Centralization, there is no uh, specific definition, I would say, but... uh, there are a couple of ways in which uh, we can distinguish the two terms. Uh, we can either follow the literature. And if we follow the literature, I would say that in a very generic manner, centralization really means power. So if you've got any power dependencies between any two elements of a system, technically that should be there is some form of centralization. Now, some say asymmetric power. I would say that power is also somehow asymmetric with respect to specific things. So power relations is really a form of centralization. Now, defining decentralization is a little bit uh, more complicated because we can say it's just the absence of power. Uh, And the literature doesn't really define decentralization as well as centralization. Now, if you would ask me, I would say that's a way to define decentralization, but uh, it's not really the only way. So we, we we may even go a little bit deeper into that later on. Uh, but I would say that another more general way to distinguish between centralization and decentralization is the concept of um, symmetry and asymmetry or, or equality and inequality, really. So if there is any symmetry or equality between any two elements across any dimension, any aspect, then somehow you have some form of centralization. And if you've got some asymmetry in the way in which two elements interact, then you may have some form of centralization. Obviously, centralization and decentralization are a, a spectrum of grays. It's it's not really black and white. So, but I would say that, uh, it, you know, some form of measurement of, of asymmetry of some kind could be a, a good, extremely generic high level way okay. to define it all right no perfect so uh, basically centralization means power someone has the power and authority and decentralization is the absence of where the power is sort of distributed vertically instead of um uh, narrowly or, or, or parallelly 
Um, yeah, I would also I would also add that uh, because you just mentioned authority uh, that probably power is even more generic than authority in the sense that if you think about you know antitrust authorities and market power, you can also have forms of power that do not necessarily entail any any type of real authority really. So it can just be some indirect manifestation of power, right? So yeah, but you know it's it's quite complicated. But yeah, pretty much like that. Ah uh, yes, no, no, it's 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 definitely hard to sum it up on you know two or three sentences. But um, yes, the, the centralization of of concentration of power for centralization, and then the distribution or decentralization or lack of power within lack the, of power, the, yeah, the, yeah. The, the lack of power within DeFi. All right, and. So, you know, this this topic of decentralization has, you know, been been coming up a lot in terms of are protocols really decentralized these days? Now, you you wrote a paper or or were one of the writers of a paper titled um, The Meaning of D or Centralization, a Theoretical Review Towards a Conceptual Framing. So in here, you speak a lot about this topic and um, you try and sort of explain and assess if a protocol is decentralized or not. Um, uh, and if a protocol is decentralized, how it can also still be centralized to some to some extent. Um, could you could you delve a bit deeper into um, this topic of are protocols really decentralized and how um, one can assess um, the answer to this question? Yeah, absolutely. I okay. So there are a few few writings among those minds that are coming up about. Uh, decentralization specifically with respect to DeFi protocols or you know crypto protocols, blockchain protocols in general. So there are various ways to to do that. Uh, so one way, which is quite uh, you know common, uh, is to actually identify the main dimensions of a protocol and to see whether this protocol is centralized or decentralized across these various dimensions. And I can think of a few few dimensions that are extremely relevant when assessing the decentralization of a protocol. One can be, you know, the concentration of power in those um, validating transactions, so miners or stakers. Uh, this, is a, this is an aspect of centralization that the literature usually focuses on. There is another aspect extremely interesting and extremely important for DeFi protocols, not necessarily for native layer one protocols, which is the concentration of governance tokens of voting rights, right? So it's a governance form of centralization, decentralization that really looks at, you know, the distribution of control rights and ownership rights over, over a protocol. But there, there can also be um, other, uh, other forms of centralization or decentralization, which are probably a little bit more, more subtle, such as, um, for instance, whether there are some hierarchical layers of chain among developers. So how decisions are taken off chain with respect to you know, what to do, how products should be changed and so on and so forth. Um, so that also could be a form of centralization, decentralization. Then of course, there is another quite standard basic thing, which is really seeing the distribution of tokens, right? So if a protocol issues tokens, whether it is a native token or it is a, you know, an application token, uh, then you see how these tokens um, move, whether they stop in big hubs that have a lot of ownership of those tokens. So in a sense, the concentration of wealth, really, right? The concentration of wealth and also how tokens move. So if there are certain hubs that intermediate almost every transactions that hold almost every token issued by a certain protocol, that is also another form of centralization, which may also be extremely relevant from a risk point of view, right? From credit risk and, and systemic risk of the entire system, a little bit as we saw with Terra USD, right? So where tokens are, whether there are ways owning that, that's, that's another extremely important thing. So I would say the governance aspect, the validation aspect, the ownership and wealth aspect, uh, the off-chain governance aspect. These are all aspects usually identified by the literature. Amazing. No, that's that's a really great overview. 
because it's very easy to say, you know, I'm, uh, you know, this is a DeFi protocol. But once you start to understand the governance and the politics and you start to uncover the layers, you start to sort of doubt um, uh, the whole concept of decentralization and and also if this is all a utopian vision um, th- that we are creating sometimes. Um, so, so you touched on some some really great aspects, you know, to assess the many dimensions of the protocol, so concentration of power, concentration of governance, the distribution of tokens, concentration of wealth, um, and this will will assist one come to a determination if there is a, a level of centralization within the DeFi protocol. Um, super interesting. And just to perhaps give a bit more context um, for our listener to be able to relate, would you be able to give one example of a protocol which is truly decentralized? And an example of a protocol which is decentralized, but actually in nature and in governance is quite centralized. And perhaps speak a bit about their governance or, or business models. Um, yeah, uh, I mean, uh, with respect to protocols that are decentralized, okay, I'm going back to what I was saying before. I don't think there is any protocol that is really decentralized. What about DAI? <laughs> Uh, I wanted to come to die, but I, at first I wanted to say what, in my opinion, remains the most decentralized protocol, believe it or not, which is Bitcoin. Okay. I, I do genuinely think that there are various aspects of Bitcoin that mm, you may consider as one of the, still, still one of the most decentralized. First of all, because it's the one with the highest market cap, it is the one with the highest um, distribution of, of, of the actual Bitcoin tokens which actually can kind of counteracts, even though we know that Bitcoins, the tokens, not the protocol, are, can actually be hold in few, few big, massive wallets. Uh, but it's still the diffusion is better than the others. And especially it's the off-chain governance of Bitcoin. The fact that, you know, Satoshi is not really a, a human being yet, <laughs> uh, which actually helps quite a lot. And also the proof of work which I still think that is way less environmentally sustainable than proof of stake as everyone's speaking about that right now. But still, I genuinely think that it might have some aspects which encourage decentralization more than proof of stake. It also makes it way less uh, possible to regulate in a sense, and we can come back Mm -hmm. on that later. So uh, DAI, you you mentioned DAI, and in fact, I think that uh, my discussion of protocols that are in fact a little bit more centralized than we thought. I actually want to discuss, uh, to say, MakerDAO and their issued stablecoin DAI. Um, the fact is that, you know, DAI, it is a crypto backed stablecoin. So, of course, uh, we can also say that this is also an aspect of decentralization in the sense that it doesn't really, it's not really backed by centralized reserves held by some custodial but it's, it's a non-custodial uh, way to manage reserves and backing, fair enough. However, DAI recently in the past year went through a big reconsideration of their governance practices. There were, there used to be the Maker Foundation. The Maker Foundation doesn't really exist anymore. Uh, they tried to dissolve it already. They spoke about that already more than a year ago. And... Um, but at the end of the day, this transition hasn't really been easy. And so uh, the governance the governance structure of Maker is actually reconsidering uh, quite hard how Maker could be governed in a proper decentralized manner. There are various, various blog posts in their website, in, in their platform that can be read about that. And they're finding this not that easy to do. And so the fact that there used to be a maker foundation, the fact that there are clearly um, few core developers and core maintainers of the protocol makes the whole MakerDAO protocol more centralized than it looks like when it comes to, uh, if you only consider their stable coin like that, right? So once again, it's important to understand that there are different dimensions to decentralization. Mm-hmm. It's not only about the stable coin, it's mm-hmm. not only about the protocol, it's also about the governance and control aspects and decision making aspects. So, yeah, but I would definitely say so that, that Bitcoin mm-hmm. is definitely more decentralized than all these other products, still. Mm-hmm. 
And that's a, a great, um, you know, a great diving into die and marker Dao because in, in actual fact, there is still some politics going on in the underlying, um, you know, driving of the protocol. So um, as you said, you really need to dive into the different dimensions and then make a fair assessment. Uh, Bitcoin, I would I would agree, is, is, is truly decentralized. There might be some other issues in terms of inflation, deflation, but in terms of governance, um, uh, I don't dispute you at all on that. Um, which actually um, uh, leads me to my next question. You mentioned proof of work, proof of stake. We recently saw the merge event take place. And this, for those of you who aren't aware, um, is where the Ethereum network shifted from proof of work to proof of stake after many grueling years of work. Now, many say that the protocol is no longer truly decentralized since now the network is mainly in the hands of six or seven stakers. Would you agree or would you disagree and why? That's a very good question. I, I do think that the shift from proof of work to proof of stake is much more meaningful and relevant than it looks like. So it's definitely not just a change in protocols. It is a change in the way in which the actual um, network, Ethereum network compared to you know, a Bitcoin network, which is still proof of work, works and operate. I definitely do think that I'm not sure exactly with respect to centralization, decentralization, when it comes to concentration of consensus power of validation power, right? So I don't have the data to say that mining in Bitcoin proof of work is more or less centralized than staking in Ethereum. I don't know that. And I don't think there is necessarily any reason to say that a staking consensus protocol is necessarily more centralized than a proof of work stake, uh, proof of work consensus protocol with respect to the concentration of power or money power. However, what I would say is that when you shift to proof of stake, the, the overall ecosystem and the way in which business is done all around now Ethereum shifts quite significantly and the opportunities to actually generate centralized points, which can also act as regulatory entry points, I do think that increases. And I will make an example uh, because it goes back to what Gary Gensler, which is the SEC uh, head, said a couple of months ago. I do think that he has a point when he says that when a protocol moves to proof of stake, then it might be much easier to regulate it. And in fact, it might be much easier to treat it as a security and therefore a, a security issuance. In that case, it is true because there are a lot of mechanisms such as liquid staking, such as delegated staking, such as staking pools and so on and so forth that make the treatment of ether much more similar to standard securities or investment contracts that are actually develop with counterparties or with intermediaries that actually generate revenues on behalf of ether owners, uh, if owners. So I do think that there is this aspect which also makes regulation a much more serious issue. That could be understood as an increase in centralization of the protocol, but not from the mining perspective, at least I'm not sure whether it's from the mining perspective. It's literally from other dynamics that is actually generating mm -hmm. no and i agree with you i mean this is obviously up for discussion and open interpretation and also to see how things will evolve but it, it looks like here yeah, we're speaking of you know centralization is when we we you know we have the power concentrated in, in the hands of one or one entity or sort of one central point and the fire is basically hands of no one here we're speaking about a sort of in between where the power is concentrated in the hands of a few so i would say that um uh, you know, in terms of in terms of governance, th there's no clear route in terms of no, it's completely centralized, no, it's completely decentralized. But we're speaking of a sort of in between, and that's that that's very hard to put into one box in terms of qualification. And that is why we're having all these sort of open debates of is it a security, is it not? Because um, you know there are certain components which are open to interpretation. So is you know illegal? You know, can Ethereum be quantified into a legal entity? No. 
but it is still to somewhat degree centralized, um, which obviously is interesting to see how things will evolve. Um, I'd like to now speak a bit about um, the OFAC, the OFAC event, which took place a few months ago. So basically, recently we saw that OFAC sent, sent a tornado cash mixer. Um, this obviously had a spillover effect onto DeFi. Um, do you think that DeFi protocols can be censored? And do you think that they should be censored? Uh, yeah, it's um, this tornado cash uh, thing is, is quite controversial. I <laughs> <laughs> and it's um, it is a uh, it opens up complicated questions. Um, so first of all, I I'm not sure exactly how to distinguish mixers such as Tornado Cash from other mixers such as any other DeFi protocol which has pools, right? So because what is a mixer? I mean, a mixer is a place where you just mix money with different provenance. You mix them and then you 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 actually bring them out uh, uh, without knowing anymore who whose money is who, right? So in a sense, a lot of DeFi protocols act as mixers um, as long as they don't have proprietary vaults, such as MakerDAO has. Well, for instance, Compounds used to have pools in version one and two, but now Compound version three has proprietary vaults. In that case, you don't have any mixers, but a lot of DeFi protocols in general do act as mixers. So first of all, uh, secondly, even banks are mixers then. You know, like they mix money in, in, you know, and you don't know whose money is what at the end of the day. So with respect to, you know, regulating or censoring DeFi protocols, well, the, the short answer is, I think that as long as, so the, the biggest distinction here is on chain versus off chain or DeFi versus Tradify in a sense. So the fact is that as long as things remain on chain within a DeFi ecosystem, then it's very hard. It's very hard for a simple reason that everything is pseudonymous and uh, and everything is uh, protected by unknown private keys and um, and uh, pseudonymous addresses uh, or accounts. So the point is, it's not possible as long as it remains in that you mm -hmm. know isolated well, series. Yeah. Well, the OFAC did actually say, "Listen, you think we are not going to censor DeFi? Well, here you go." This is, you know, the open source code. We are defining it, censored, and everyone who is receiving or sending transactions related to this mixer basically has to be frozen. So Circle had, had frozen 75,000. So in essence, I agree with you that in reality, you know, the, the source code shouldn't be allowed to be censored because what are you what are you censoring? You're not really censoring anyone. We should be technology neutral. And it's a very dangerous precedent to set. And this is why I think it was so controversial because OVAC sort of overstepped their boundaries and said, we don't really care. We need to stop money laundering. And we think this is the easiest way to do it. Um, so now we're seeing an even more dangerous interplay between you know, DeFi and the authorities, which are saying, well, this is the only way that we can operate. So you have no choice but to comply. Yeah, no, I do think, I do think, I mean, I do think that there are AML and KYC uh, uh, measures that have to be enforced. The problem is that, as you, you just mentioned, Circle, exactly, because Circle can act as that centralized regulatory entry point that has to comply with, you know, regulatory measures. And in that case, it is possible. And in a sense, you know, for the... Uh, for the correct functioning of an economy, there may be, there should be some regulatory mm -hmm. measures in place. The problem is that if no one is there is if there is no interface with anything such as Circle or anything such as Coinbase or anything such as any actually compliant register licensed, um, which which Coinbase had relation with with Tornado Cash, uh, any licensed uh, entity, then it becomes extremely hard, mm -hmm. of course. Mm -hmm. No, I agree. I agree. I mean, in, in crypto, you know, every, every single day, you know, so, something has happening. It could be the tornado mixture. Yesterday we saw FTX, you know, the downfall of Terra. And this makes, you know, opens up 
Pandora's box of 300 other aspects and components. It could be privacy, it could be regulation, it could be um, whatever it is. So, I mean, it's ve very, very interesting to, to discuss and interpret, but who's right, who's wrong, you know, it's also very, very subjective at times, depending on whose interest you're trying to protect. Um, now, I'd, I'd just like to cover a bit uh, the topic on stable coins. Now, stable coins, of course, is a, a beast of its own um, in terms of a, a topic. However, I know that you're currently working on a, a very high level paper centering around stable coins, their composition, their governance, their reserves. Um, how, how would you say that stable coins fit into this, this space in terms of taxonomies and, 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 and crypto, um, uh, crypto assets taxonomies? Uh, very, very interesting question. Thank you, Justin. So the stablecoin chapter is, is a very big chapter. It's, uh, it's very hard to, to synthesize it into a few minutes. But the point is that stablecoins are key for, for the crypto economy. It's really probably one of the very few uh, necessary pillars of, for DeFi and the crypto economy to really integrate with centralized traditional finance and move on. Um, stable coins are an elusive concept. Mm, different legislations and different regulatory guidelines treat them differently. Um, it is not clear whether they should be treated as e-money, e whether they should be treated as securities, uh, whether they should be treated as something else, just tokenized assets in general. Well, Mika, does make a difference between asset reference tokens and e-money tokens. They are both technically stable coins. Um, the US um, Senate and uh, the Congress are trying to de develop bills with respect to stable coins. And one of the biggest problem is how do you regulate issuers of stable coins? But the key point that I would like to make is that the reason why Stable coins are so key in in the crypto ecosystem is that it's the only tool that allows intertemporal financial services. Let let me put it like that. Because over the blockchain in general, all financial transactions are atomic, which means that you execute a transaction and the transaction is understood by the network as instantaneous. So the transaction starts and ends instantaneously. And so you transfer a Bitcoin, you transfer an ETH, it occurs instantaneously. So either the transaction goes or it doesn't. Now, stable coins allow for the build of a big part of financial services that actually develop over time. They don't start and end instantaneously in the same time, but they start in time one and it they end in time two, three, four, five, we don't know, right? Such as lending, borrowing, uh, such as portfolio management. So all these kind of financial interactions that require a contract that develops across many interactions or transactions over time. In order to, do, to implement these financial services, you definitely do need some stability of value that actually can act as buffer, a store of value, from the time when you start a transaction to the time when you, uh, a contractual interactions to the time when you close the contractual interaction, so we, you withdraw the funds. And so this is why stable coins are so key because they actually allow for all these type of financial services, which are not atomic, which is not instantaneous, such as a payment, such as a withdrawal at the cash machine, but they actually entail a ongoing intertemporal interactions between counterparties. In that case, you do need stable coins. And um, so as everyone is trying to understand, we, we have to build the crypto economy over stable coins for that specific reasons. Really. The, the biggest problem is how you treat them, how you regulate them. And it's still not very clear because there are so many types of stable coins clearly, which is very problematic to fall within a single category. Yes, and, and the issue as well is that stable coins are there to be used in a global nature and an international nature. So if you have Mika coming up with one framework, the US coming up with one framework, Asia coming up with one framework, and the point is for me to send a stable coin from here to the US, to Asia, to Africa, this is obviously very disruptive. So in a way, it doesn't really work. And we're still, you know, trying to um, 
remain within our closed ecosystems, which is completely contrary to the nature and the use and the purpose of stable coins. Um, on this note, you mentioned Mika. So, so under Mika, we do have stable coins, which are defined as e-money, and then basically everything else is, which is still a stable coin, is is defined under asset reference tokens. Um, Mika, however, has left out DeFi. Uh, the European Commission said that. 18 months after the first entry into force of MICA, they will publish something covering DeFi and NFTs. But till then, it is largely left out. This is probably because they are still figuring it out. And it is definitely no easy task to regulate uh, DeFi, specifically because of all the um, you know, complex dimensions that, that you spoke about earlier. When, when MICA 2.0 eventually does come into force, probably in a couple of years' time, how do you think that the EU will attempt to regulate DeFi? <laughs> and this is the million I dollar wish, question. I, yeah, I wish <laughs> I knew. I mean, I don't think there is uh, any specific uh, understanding at the moment of what should be done. Uh, what I do think, though, is that um, when you regulate DeFi in the same way, I mean, when you regulate anything, really, um, you look at risks, right? So usually the general principle of regulation is same activity, same risk, same regulation. And so that's, I think that's a reasonable starting point to start to think about DeFi regulation. And um, I do think that if you take the, you know, three main risk categories, market risk, credit risks, op risk, or, you know, technology risk, whatever, um, then what you have to understand is how can you translate these categories of risks to the actual activities or architectures that a standard DeFi application, a standard DeFi protocol does? Um, so in that case, one way in which I would put it is to break down the various layers or the various dimensions that actually enable a DeFi protocol to operate and enable the DeFi protocol to actually manage risk and lower risk possibly, and try to see if there are regulatory entry points there um, that could be subject to some form of oversight or regulation. Now, it could be the, um, the uh, funds, so the vaults, as I was saying, so the, the place where collaterals are locked, uh, pools, vaults, or these kinds of things, which are actually backing the value of any DeFi issued token. It could actually be the governance tokens itself, uh, because very often governance tokens, whether it's Maker, whether it's Comp, whether it's Aave, whether it's Uni, they actually do act as a recapitalization tool and, uh, and um, tools of Rust resort to actually make protocols um, viable and sustainable in case of um, in case of market meltdowns. And we saw that we saw that, for instance, uh, with Maker in 2020, uh, there was this uh, the Black Thursday and uh, March 2020, I guess it was basically it, it actually triggered um, that options when it actually issued a lot of maker governance tokens to actually buy back a lot of dies, um, and we also saw it with the Terra USD collapse, right? So that one of the reasons why the algorithmic stablecoin Terra USD collapsed is that eventually Luna, the actual governance token of Terra, uh, didn't have any market value, right? So the the arbitrage, the buyback of stable coins couldn't be enacted because if the overall capitalization of the governance token collapses under a certain level, is not able to sustain the value of the stable coin itself, right? So what I'm trying to say is that what regulators should do is try to understand how risks emerge in these protocols, break down it into few easy and clear um, categories of risk management or risk sources, and try to see what can be done, how it can be done to regulate the specific aspects of DeFi protocols. Amazing. Yes, I completely agree. 
And perhaps I think they would also look into the aspects that you spoke about earlier in terms of are DeFi protocols centralized? And if they are centralized, maybe try and group them under some, some legal qualifications in terms of compliance. Obviously, technically and operationally, this might be very hard to implement, but that might also be a, a point in terms of assessment that they, they will probably look into. Um, okay, I'd just like to ask you one last question, which is more of an opinion question. Um, are you yourself in favor of complete decentralization? And do you think DeFi is more of a utopian vision or is something which actually can be and should be achieved? So it's maybe mm. a philosophical question. Yeah, but, uh... but I, I like philosophical questions. No, um, I mean, I will tell you more. I don't think that complete decentralization, um, first of all, it exists. Uh, I don't think it's feasible. My After researching for a couple of years about centralization, decentralization, I'm quite confident uh, in saying that any form of decentralization has to be supported or rely on some centralization somewhere else, precisely because for decentralization to make sense and to exist, it has to be complemented by centralization somewhere else that make decentralization possible itself. I don't see any system, how any system can be fully decentralized. I think that full decentralization is a impossibility uh, somehow. You can treat it like that. I'm working on other papers and my conclusions of other works that I'm doing is that probably the only way in which you can have a fully decentralized system is probably a system that is completely static completely dead um, and where the various elements um, do not dynamically interact in any way among them in a sense. So it's a kind of uh, a death and entropy system that, that doesn't really, where doesn't nothing really happens. So I don't think that full decentralization is feasible or possible. And even if it was, going back to your question, I don't think he, it is something that should be um, aim for, uh, for the simple reason that uh, those aspects of centralization that, in my opinion, always support or enable decentralization somewhere else are actually necessary to make the whole system work. Um, so to counter crimes, to actually give stability, to actually give the possibility to the system to counter meltdowns or unexpected events or collapses to kind of enforce disruptive changes and not just incremental changes. So all this kind of stuff, um, you know, to reform itself, all this kind of stuff. So the ultimate governance layer requires some form of centralization. You know, you said that that was a philosophical question. Well, I will end up with the most philosophical probably, you know, uh, this debate about centralization and decentralization reminds me very much about the debate of many centuries ago about the existence of God. Let me tell you that. So usually Aquinas or a lot of philosophers, Christian philosopher uh, Cartesius as well, eventually said that God must exist because at the end of the day, if there are various layers of the world that moves somehow, somewhere up there, there must be a fixed <laughs> reference that makes everything else move. So I, I, it's, it's, not, it's not my position <laughs> with respect to God, but it's my position with respect to centralization and decentralization. I love the analogy. <laughs> at the end of the day, there must be some fixed reference framework who acts a centralized framework that allows for all other higher frameworks to actually behave in a decentralized manner. Amazing. That was definitely a great way to end the question. I would say it's a, it's a wrap on that note. Um, thank you so much. That was that was really really insightful. Uh, before before I let you go, um, I would just like to invite you uh, to take part in a round called "I Call Bullshit." So just tell me if you think the following is is true or false. According to a recent Bloomberg report. 35% of Nigeria's 217 million population are using the government-issued central bank digital currency called the E-Naira. Is this true or false? 
No, I think it's I think it's totally false. <laughs> I don't, it, it is I false. Tend not to, yeah, I tend not to believe this kind of thing. It is false. So according to reputable sources, only 0.5% of the population are using e-Naira wallets. The reason is that e-Naira gives persons claims directly against the central bank, and the Naira has been devalued around six times since 2015. Economists expect a further loss of 20% in, in, in value next year. So inflation and trust are the, are the main issues that this actually hasn't taken off in terms of adoption. All right, thank you. Um, uh, so listen, Enrico, <laughs> thank you so much for joining the conversation. You've really tried to help break down these very, very complex uh, topics. I really can't wait to see the work that you're going to do in terms of crypto policy with the FCA. I think that will be really, you know, revolutionary in terms of uh, influence and direction. Um and I'd also like to invite you uh, to take part in a future session in the coming weeks on stable coins, because I think this is a really hot topic and a very important topic, even um, especially in terms of, of DeFi and, and trading. Um, thank you very much for joining the conversation. It has been a real pleasure. Um, to our listener, thank you for tuning in. If you want to contact Enrico Rossi, you can find him on LinkedIn. His referred papers will be found in the text box underneath the episode. So please stay tuned for our next episode, which will be held in two weeks time, um, where we will be talking about what is going on in the NFT space. Thanks again, Enrico. Thank you, Justin. <laughs>